long hair, your hips and back because your muscles were strong, two columns of muscle curving toward the spine, and your shoulders rounded where I placed my palm while you told me the story. That story of you as a girl and your voice, that vibration, your hand like a wave that moved the sea. Because you were strong like your father, you said. You, your father, and he was strong from his walks on the mountain, those long walks, philosophical contemplations which served his wandering disposition because I inherited your father's body, you said. And you turned toward me, your child, alone on the couch. You turned slow, though you timed it just right so your skirt swirled around your thighs and the inner lining flashed with gold. Okay, Alexandros, you said, it's time for bed. And you looked at me, your little boy, small with a book on his lap, and I looked at you, my mother, Sofrosini in costume, the dancer, are you ready, my love? And you reached toward me and led me to my tiny room because that night, like every night, you tucked me in bed, vigorous, meticulous, because that's how I liked it, how I asked at the beginning when I was little, four or five years old, I guess, because that's when you first started leaving me at night to go to work. And you stretched the sheets around my body and you tucked them tight like a silk cocoon. I'll be home at the usual time, you repeated. And then you ensured that I had my provisions, three books, one glass of water, and the phone placed on the nightstand behind, beside me, emergency numbers written in ink, and you sat at the edge of my bed in your costume, and you placed your hand on my chest, because you leaned forward to kiss me, always, always, before you left me, because this was our ritual, you on my bed, and me, and your kiss, and your hand was on my chest as I breathed, and your eyes were always closed. I love you, Alexandros. More than life, I love you. And then you stood to go, to lock the door, to go to work, to leave me alone in our tiny apartment. Me too, I said, always, because this was our ritual, me too, I would say, but only after the door clicked shut. And I wonder whether you ever imagined me there, alone in the bed, your little boy, while you were at work, a boy who gripped his book and tried so hard to focus on that made a world to focus hard, so it took me in the words surrounding, becoming a forest of darkness that held me, protected me, in its wild nature, because this I could understand. If I focused my mind, if I felt my full imagination, I could try to understand the world inside the book, because you needed me to be strong, and I could, Mama. I could be strong for you, your little boy alone in bed, gripping the book in my hands. And I wonder, did you imagine me there, in bed, alone while you were at work, because I imagined you. I love you, Alexandros, more than life itself. And it's getting late. The sky has turned a deep blue like a fresh bruise, and the trees are fully black and inky black, and hundreds of branches are dark against the bruised and beautiful sky, because I think about that now, about you and us and those moments and why, and your body on the precipice and mine on the ground, and your breath, your voice, and the taste in my mouth, because I think I found it just now. Just here, as I lie in the dirt, I think I've named my question, and I wish I could tell you. So that's the end of chapter one. And the question that Alexandros, this boy, has come up with for his senior thesis, he's a university student, is the meaning of the word Sofrasini. And Sofrasini is um, one of four Socratic virtues along with wisdom, courage, and justice. And um, so for Sini, we've sort of lost it 
we don't have a direct, a proper, and adequate translation for it, but it means self-control or self-restraint, um, modesty, temperance, chastity, all of which are totally inadequate to explain what Socrates actually meant by this concept of sophosceny. So I became intrigued by this word and by the fact that our culture seems to have lost a comprehension of what this what this um, word might mean. Not a denial of desire, but an ability to hold desire without immediately uh, reacting or acting on it. What does it mean to restrain oneself um, without living in a state of denial of desire. How can those two truths be held within one body? So I, I started exploring it in this book and exploring it in the context of um, a digital, our digital age. So that's what this book really is. Um, and it's also, has it, it's odd. <laughs> <laughs> so rhythmically and, and just in terms of um, structuring, structuring so the syntax such that it often begins with and, but, or because. So there's a, um, without necessarily cueing the reader toward what those phrases refer to, because what, you know, mm -hmm. and what. That sentence doesn't seem to refer back to anything that has a clear causal link. So in that way, I'm sort of carving um, an interior space and an atmosphere of questioning and without necessarily filling that space with content that the reader uh, explicitly knows. So it's more about um, creating an atmosphere through um, pulling logic to its extremes and, and um, to the point where logic breaks, to the point where um, language can no longer contain um, uh, what we're attempting to say or comprehend or call into awareness what our body already knows. So that's what I'm trying to do and I'm going to read more. <laughs> this is going to be a good Because the book is there beneath the bed. And I could read the passage, reach down, search with my hand for that slim book beneath my bed because it's there next to the others. The book I stole and the book you gave, the smell of time in the pages because I could search, but my hand is on my belly and I don't want to move it. I'd like to keep it here, my fingers circling, twisting the hair on my lower abs, black hair, a thin trail, and then the coarse, but your hair was beautifully soft because I don't understand how we knew. So for seeing the calm sea, so difficult to attain. That's the definition Frederick Nietzsche gave. Frederick Nietzsche, the birth of tragedy. Because he could have given me countless books, a whole history of thought in his office on his shelves, but this is the one my professor chose, and this is the one that I needed now, because that is the role of the teacher, you said, to sense when knowledge can be introduced within each specific student, to sense his ripeness, you said, his readiness to receive. And you told me once the gift in your hand on the day that was ours most intimately. There's a party next door thumping music a Friday night, and I could go there if I wanted. I could go alone, and maybe I'd meet someone who wanted a little of the Dionysian, Dionysian that D Nietzsche describes. A tiny modicum of ecstasy, one drop or a spurt from the vine, and a kiss as I slip away home to this place and this bed and the weight of the books beneath me. Because I might go over. Or maybe I'll stay here, my hand on my chest, on the hair, on the nipple, and Sarah was lovely last night. Because I could go to Sarah, but I've seen her too often, this woman who's starting to ask me questions as if she has the right to know, because knowledge can't be closed once it's opened, you said, and I told her that, but she didn't understand. So I'll stay here, alone, with the thumping music that's pulsing the wall with bursts of laughter like ugly intrusions and the books I keep beneath the bed as if buried deep 
and loamy soil because he couldn't possibly know about that, about you and our day and the scent on my skin, but he knew somehow that I needed that book, The Birth of Tragedy, Friedrich Nietzsche, the way that horror was made sublime, because you could show me a single song, a single dance, you showed me the movement that Nietzsche describes from ecstasy to purity, from Dionysus into Apollo, because we need to touch along that vein of pulse so sweetly grotesque that we can't remain, although we want to, tempted to remain too long, too sweet inside that touch of Dionysus fusion with primal being, he writes, because we die in that place in that gruesome night, which is why we must be lifted upward, cleansed by a river of beauty, because Apollo's beauty can wash away the gore that's smeared on our skin, the birth of tragedy, because you were beauty in the dance. An ideal beauty, so for seeing, serene power, but only because it's been taken, submerged in that opulent truth of Dionysus, drowned as if by blood, by love, and then returned the Apollonian to Dionysian and back, but sullied now, sullied and filthy from that descent and pleading to be cleansed. Because the movement itself would call you down, and I saw you attempt to remain there merely dancing but starting to fear of yourself sliding because it wasn't pristine anymore. You would undulate as I sat on the couch reading or writing, contemplating all your questions, all my questions, the possible meanings, but I'd sense your body as it prepared for the taking. Because I think you tried to take me with you. As, it, as you sensed it might come, you would tease me toward that space with a deceptively simple question. What does that imply, Alexandros? A question or a move repeated, consciously repeated, aware of the gazes of mine on yours, your image in the mirror as you slowed the move, lengthened the rhythm's wild and naked nature, he wrote, and the hurt flowed through my body, all through my body, an overpowering, warm pain that I could have liked if I let myself like it, if I let myself go. And I think it gripped you. I don't think you had control when you moved like that. When you stood with one leg bent slipped through the slit in your skirt, the fabric parting around your thigh, your leg thrust forward onto tiptoe, the muscle defined as you eased along the pull of your body, up and down the pull of your body, your shoulders rolling, such sinuous rolling, your arms stretched wide, because I think you were afraid to descend again to that place without logic or beauty, that place, the pleasure of Dionysus, and so you wanted me with you because you could hold me close, keep strong for me, courageous, virtuous, soothing me so you could soothe yourself. It's okay, my love. Everything will be okay. Such soothing whispers, your hand in my hair, and my body was pressed into yours. Maybe it was different. Maybe you wanted to punish me, to hate me, while you held me, clutching my body to your chest because maybe you wanted to see with your true emotion, your pure and potent disdain, your belief that I am vile, my innocence is vile because it implicates you in your filth, my goodness, my innocence, my existence hurt you. And maybe you wanted to make me filthy too. Because Nietzsche can spew about gruesome nights of primal being, he could make those words into works of philosophy which we all read as if they were vital, as if they were living, breathing things that we might love even after they leave us. But you know better than that. Because you felt those words in your body, Sophia, before you became my mother, a dancer, a woman whose stage name supplanted the first. And I want 
to understand what happened, the story behind the ideas, because I try so hard. I try to give that dark night content, but always it mocks me, and I make a scene and a man, and the man becomes a mouth that laughs with derision, derisive laughter, mocking my seeking, and his mouth is wide with hunger. And then I make a girl, but she slips away. She slips into breasts and lips and fingers, and all of it spreads into darkness that swallows me. A church, a tower, a precipice, books, an old book with pretty wildflowers pressed inside, a pungency I breathe as she breathes, and I make it up because I make the story of you in my fantasy, the girl on the mountain in Greece pretending the candles and whispers the cantor's voice, but the hands were clasped before his belt because no one was watching, not even the scholars who visited from Oxford, no one at least, that you could see. But I didn't intend to steal that book. And I need you to know, because I don't think I ever told you what happened, not at least regarding the book that I've kept beneath my bed, beside the birth, beside the gift, and maybe on top, but I could grab it now. If I lie on my belly with my hips pressed down, my hand reaching under the bed, because I've got it now, this book in my hand with the photos, the beautiful thing. My neighbors would laugh if they knew what I did, just beyond this wall, this thumping music, a whole big party flirtation, hookups, frothy beer, and I wonder what they'd think if they burst through the door and they saw me like this, if they caught me here in my private thoughts as I hold the child's book to my chest. Because the plastic on the book has kept, kept it safe and I need to explain. Because I never intended to do what I did back then when I was a child. Because I borrowed the book like I did every Tuesday, dozens of library books at a time, and I thought I'd return it the following week when I went to the library after school, but that week came, and then another, and then I received a message from the library, which I quickly deleted before you could hear it, because I couldn't return that book, and I needed you to understand the resistance I felt, because I knew it was wrong, I knew it was bad, but I sensed a deeper rightness beneath, because no one could possibly love that book as deeply as I did, and that love in my mind made it mine. There are others, of course, other books that I love that are talismans or touchstones, but this is the only book that I stole, and that fact is important because if the dialogues teach us anything, it's the monstrous power of illicit desire, monstrous, heroic, divine, because I swore that I would return to, I swear, I said, and when the librarian insisted that the book was overdue, I made a whole long story. I know I returned it, I said, because it squashed my snack. It was such a big book that it squashed my pear right in the backpack on the day I returned it, and I was really upset, I said, that the book's pages got sticky with pear, just a few of the pages. I didn't ruin the book, I exclaimed, I promise. I wasn't even lying when I told her the story, not really. Because that story was real to me as I spoke at recalling the pear on the book of the sugars, my fear at seeing the stain on the pages. And even though it never happened, I was remembering, feeling the story physically in my body just as I spoke the words, I swear I repeated. But always after I kept that book beneath my bed, as a child and now, my small single bed like the one at home, narrow and small, especially when shared. So, do you have any questions? <laughs> Was it a, um, like a head nod to St. Augustine, the prayer? Or something that no, tell me that reference. I don't know that reference. Oh, uh, he was all about like this denying like pleasures. I think there was, there was one part where he like crossed over to a neighbor's yard and stole a pear or something. 
Anyway, it just reminded me a lot that oh he stole the gosh. gold. Oh my gosh, it's in there. Uh, maybe I like, like subconsciously remember because I yeah. read Saint Augustine for a long time ago, yeah, so yeah. maybe that was yeah, in there it somewhere. Was, there was like a play, and they made me clever. Oh, okay. <laughs> but he's had like a lot of guilt about this one pair. That's like his big crime of his entire lifetime. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was he had oh. he had some fun <laughs> before he, you know. Um, but that's that's actually an interesting thing too that that you bring up Saint Augustine because the the concept of Sophrosyne goes from being this like really, like like Socrates had, it, and it's all in the book. He defines it in this dialogue Carmides where, um, it's like dripping with desire. These early Socratic dialogues are dripping with like so he defines it as like he's outside the gates of the wrestling school where the boys, can, like they're practicing naked in this open pit. And they like slather themselves with oil, and then smear themselves with dust. And the men stand around, and they watch them. And like, and then the men are waiting outside for the boys to come out. And Socrates approaches, and they begin discussing this concept of self-restraint. And just as Socrates is about to describe what self, you know, to question people about what self-restraint means, this boy Hermides walks out of the gates, and and. As he sits on the bench beside Socrates, his tunic falls open, and Socrates catches a glimpse of his chest, and the, the dialogue is like, you know, he says, I was on fire. I was like a fawn being led to the jaws of a lion, right? Like, it's just, it's, it's, and from there you go on to describe the concept of what it means to act both feeling desire and not being ruled by desire. Hmm. So it's like, you're, but the only way in which you can truly possess yourself is is to allow yourself to feel te to feel that sensation to feel attraction seduction because that that um, that energy is what for the Greeks anyway um, rises you to a different level of thought. Like philosophy is based on the feeling of desire, and 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 yet Socrates doesn't. He's able to feel it without immediately acting on it in a way that takes him out of his own sort of um, ethical framework. And then the Christians take it and they make the concept of Sophrosyne into a concept of, of, of self-denial, of denial of desire, of chastity. And that, that would be more Augustine. Mm -hmm. I haven't read as much of St. Augustine, so I can't speak directly to him. Yeah, so that's sort of like the lineage of that concept, and Nietzsche like tried to reclaim it, and um, and then he did not act with Sophrosyne either, but nonetheless, um, and I just became really curious about this concept, given our society's like appetite and how our appetite is affecting our ability to live as the human animal on, on the world, given that we're destroying it, <laughs> for example. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah. Should we have more music or do more? I think it was, I mean, that was great. This whole side of the bookcase is speaking to you. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Love that. <laughs> yeah, there's a scene in a, in, in a library, too. I like Frank's I'd actually love to hear, like, a little bit more. Oh. If you'd be open to it. Sure, thanks a lot. Why not? Okay. Can I ask you just one question? Sure. Yeah. Did you get into philosophy because of you, these were ideas, this whole idea of desire and restraint and all this, because these were ideas that were compelling to you and then somehow led you into philosophy? Or were you always... No, it wasn't. You know what? It's funny. I never took a philosophy. The kid is a philosophy major at Princeton. I went to Princeton. I never took a philosophy course. <laughs> I've never studied philosophy. So all of it is self-taught, which in a way is really interesting because then you meander through and find threads that maybe a professor wouldn't structure, right? Like you sort of see connections that aren't a part of the canon or the right. sort of um, prescribed way of seeing things. Um, but no, you know, I started reading philosophy at a really low point and a friend recommended that I read this crazy book by Deleuze and it's Guattari, or I don't know how it's pronounced, Deleuze and Guattari called 
um, called Anti Oedipus, mm -hmm. and um, he's reading it, and I and I see a Jewish kind of. Anyway, he's reading it, and I and I was in a bookstore. Uh, the bookstore is sadly gone now, but they had this huge philosophy um, section, and I just sat, and it was a really bad moment. I just you know anyway, and I sat there and just pulled. And I didn't know what the hell I was reading. Especially anti Oedipus is crazy, right? But it's so alive. And I just like I just thought, I don't know what these men are talking about, but but there's a there's a I feel their necessity to say it and I, I want that. Like I want in. Yeah. Um, and and that's when I started reading philosophy. And it was as a way of trying to come to some comprehension of what was going on in my own life is to read a purity of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. That was a long um, okay, so I'll read which should I read? Um, I'll read from later in the book, I guess. So this is so part of the problem with what happened with this book is it began by him talking to his mother and addressing so there's this a, a whole book is a a direct address to this absent you. Um, uh, and then, but then it started becoming really enclosed. And, you know, okay, we get that there's like weird erotic tension between the mother and the son. <laughs> now what? You know, like I wrote a lot of scenes that never made it into the book because it was like, okay, we've been there. <laughs> like, like, let's move this forward. But it was incredibly difficult to figure out how to move it forward, um, how to introduce a, another character without losing that direct address. Because then you suddenly have him like describing this other person's backstory, like to her, like how, what would compel him to be um, discussing these thoughts to his mother? So that was that was my dilemma. Nonetheless, so I will read you a bit from where I finally figured out a way to introduce um, his love interest. His name is uh, Meiko. Um, okay. So he is now, he's sitting on a sculpture, a Henry Moore sculpture called Oval with Points, and he's recalling he had been there with Mako um, previously. Um, Okay, and I give to you, and he had just been describing some moments with Mako when they had been on the sculpture before. And I give to you these slightest stories as I lie here cradled by the sculpture because I've come tonight to oval with points this dignified work by Henry Moore, her favorite spot which she guided me toward. Because I lie back on this tube of metal, the two points pinched from the inner curve, and they reach toward the center, the two tips reach as if coming together, framing the sky, because the sculpture seems to form a window, letting me see as I think about her, as I give my thoughts about her to you. And I notice some stars now. There they are, five stars framed by the sculpture, different points, disparate points that remain unconnected unless I make a story for you. Because I could do that. I could draw an image, a cause, an effect no more implausible than that of Orion. Three stars forming his belt, his muscular body as he pulls the bow, the hunter, the arrow, the veins on his arm. But it only coheres because of us. Because we make a story and grip so tight as if it were true. How did you come up with your thesis topic, she asked one month ago, and I paused to consider how I should answer, recalling that day with the dirt on my skin and the trees, trunks of the trees that reminded me fully. In a state of submission and total confusion, I finally said, and she laughed. That's a good place to start, don't you think? Because Mayiko doesn't know the story.